Hello and welcome everyone to one of the final talks in Epigram's Bristol, Britain and Beyond week-long festival of talks about journalism and the media. Uh, I'm Phyllis, I'm the news editor at Epigram, University of Bristol's award-winning student newspaper and for tonight's talk we're joined by Bristol's very own Martin Booth, editor of Bristol 24-7, the leading online arts and entertainment magazine available across Bristol. Uh, Martin's also recently written the book 111 Places That You Shouldn't Miss in Bristol, and uh, which has been described as the ultimate insider's guide to the city. So we're going to talk a bit about Martin's role at Bristol 24-7, Martin's advice for people wanting to go into journalism, and then also talk about Bristol outside of the student bubble. Um, so if you have any questions for Martin, please do go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll come back to them at the end for a short Q&A. But could I start off, Martin, by asking you about your role at Bristol 24-7? What was your route to becoming editor and what does your day to day as editor sort of look like? Well, good questions. Thanks very much. Um, good evening, everybody. So if I'm fit, look a bit flustered, I've literally just cycled back from Ashley Down at 100 miles an hour. Um, so that is an example of what my day looks like, because as well as being, I kind of, I described myself as like a player manager the other day using, um, using a footballing analogy, because in Bristol 24-7, there's only three of us on the editorial team full time. So we've all got to basically do everything. So, so yeah, I was talking to people who'd climbed up an uh, oak tree and actually down that the council are looking to uh, fell because its roots are under a nearby tree. So um, yes, I do a lot of reporting as well as looking after the whole editorial um, process at Bristol 24-7. So, um, so for those that aren't aware of what we do, we started off as a monthly magazine and a website, it's probably more, more web focused than magazine focused. We've always been online first. The magazine has always been a really great part of what we do. Um, but COVID, I'm sure you've heard all this week about trials and tribulations during the pandemic. So our model of distributing our magazine for free in cafes, restaurants, bars, music venues, obviously they're not open anymore. So that we've got nowhere to put our magazine. So Fortunately, we have been fully focused on the website since we started six years ago, really. We've got a, um, we've got a website that just needs constant, uh, constant feeding because people are used to finding out what's going on in Bristol, the latest news, the latest news about oak trees and Ashley Down that people have climbed up, all of that kind of thing. So, um, so we are... We're now 100% um, online, um, which, is, um, which is a slightly different way of doing things, but, but, um, but it's, been, it's been really challenging, but really rewarding switching to that 100% um, online, online, online um, publication. Um, so, Apologies for those that have heard my route into journalism before. Um, for those that have maybe even their fourth year of Epigram, you, you might have heard this spiel four times already. So apologies for that. But I always say when talking to um, talking to student journalists that, and I don't know how long I can get away with saying this. I can't get away with saying this for too much longer, but. It doesn't fail very long ago that I was a student journalist myself um, up in Durham at the equivalent of um, Epigram up there, which is called Palatinate. And I was the sports editor of Palatinate in my second year. Um, literally, we used to put together the newspaper in a, in a tiny broom cupboard with, with computers that just didn't work which hasn't changed in professional journalism from those days at all. Still cursing technology every minute of my waking life. Um, but I um, went on from graduating um, 
to straight to the times actually i was um lucky enough to land a editorial assistant role um on the foreign desk in wapping um when the times was in wapping and then i went from there to the houses of parliament office um so i kind of did things the wrong way around i started my journalism my professional journalism career like right at the top on the foreign desk at the times in the house of commons in the lobby um but i was more on the kind of admin assistant side of things so i wanted to actually be a journalist be a reporter so i did my nctj at harrow um in uh, north northwest london which is um where I grew up, um, did my NCTJ there, and then I went straight from there to the Watford Observer, which was my local paper um, when I was growing up. So my very first journalism was done for the Watford Observer when I was still at school. I used to write match reports when I was, you know, still, still um, maybe like 13, 14, having my first byline, which is just amazing, um, the opportunities that are there if you take them um so i kept in touch with people which is really important and you know any work experience that you guys do um keep in touch don't don't be overly overly um uh be enthusiastic um don't be annoying um but keep in touch that's a really really important thing to do wherever you end up on on, on your work experience um work experience is absolutely key. I'm probably answering all your questions uh, right now, but work experience is absolutely key. So so, so I got my job um, at the Times through work experience, at the Watford Observer through work experience. Then I was um, seeing a girl in um, Bristol. So while I was a reporter on the Watford Observer, I did a week's work experience at the Evening Post, what's now called the Bristol Post. But made it be known that I was a trained journalist. So then I I got um, I got shifts, what's called uh, shifts on the paper at the weekend. Um, so I used to do Monday to Friday at the Watford Observer, and then do Saturdays in Bristol. Um, so I've got children running around behind me. Um, and um, when when the job came up at the at the Bristol Post, I'd put myself uh, first in the queue. Um, so I was at the Bristol Post for a couple of years, um, and um, and then I I started my own blog when I was in Bristol. Um, kind of didn't um, didn't see eye to eye with management at the Post. I was a bit more kind of quirky, fun stories at the time, and it was quite straight back then. So I was kind of. I was I, I had a really great role as a news features writer when I started at the post and then kind of just got shunted aside a little bit. So the more I got shunted aside, the more I concentrated on my blog um, that then turned into when I left the post, when I was made redundant from the post, um, I still just kept the blog glowing. The blog then turned into a website um, one day, kind of like MI5, I got a tap on the shoulder by someone who's like, I really want to set up Bristol's best news. It's like, would you like to help? Um, would you like to help uh, be launch editor, launch co-editor at the time? Um, and um, and I said, yes, please. That was just me, literally just me. Um, my my now wife was helping uh, sell a few adverts just to keep, be able to wash its face as the phrase goes. I never really liked that phrase, but um, I managed to earn money from the website to make a little bit of a living. Um, so when I got that tap on the shoulder, I went from it being me to having team of journalists working for me, sales team, a magazine. I was kind of fast tracked 10 years from where I uh, was to where I really wanted to be in a very short space of time. Um, and so, yeah, for the last six, seven years, 
um, Bristol has, I think a lot of people say in journalism, it's really important to find a specialism. Um, my specialism now is Bristol. So, um, so that in a nutshell is, is, uh, is how I got to where I am today. Um, that is my route into journalism. So you've had a sort of winding route to Bristol 24 seven, um, which is really interesting to hear. And um, we'll talk a bit more about how maybe the advice you have for people wanting to go into journalism in a bit. But could I first ask you about Bristol? Um, obviously it has a lot of claims to fame and you've written a book about all the things you shouldn't miss in Bristol. What would you say is your favorite thing about Bristol or favorite places? And I appreciate you've got 111. So <laughs> if you could narrow it down to one thing. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know what? That That's the hardest question. And I think that that question for me, that changes every, changes every day. Um, it probably depends where I've been cycling that particular day. So but one of my absolute favorite parts of Bristol is St. Werbergs. Mm -hmm. And St. Werbergs is one of those places in Bristol where you might not know about it until you've actually been there because you don't go through it to get anywhere. It's just a little bit out on a limb. There's parts of some Werbergs where you've got to go through this tiny tunnel and then you come out the other side and it opens up into, there's a, there's a city farm there and it's, um, and it's just such a, such a special place with its own really, really unique character to it. Um, there's, um, there's a road, it's minor, minor road, um, and it's got, um, and it's got the classics. It's, it's one of those roads where it's got the, it's got a brilliant greengrocer, it's got, it's got a brilliant butchers, it's got a brilliant bakers, it's got a fantastic restaurant called the Cauldron that once upon a time, hopefully it will again cook all its food over, um, you know, no gas involved, like all just fire. Um, it's got it's got two amazing breweries, um, Wiper, Wiper and True. If you like your Bristol beer, it's probably um, you've had some of some of their beer. Um, if not, Wiper and True, another top tip. And that's brewed in St. Werbergs. So Minor Roads Tunnel is one of the chapters in my book. It's just a, it's a long, long tunnel, and it's and it's just become this this outdoor street art canvas, um, kind of like kind of like Stokes Croft that I'm sure you guys are aware of, um, but just within this tunnel, um, it's uh, so St Werbergs. So it's got so many special memories. There's amazing views over the city as well. So um, so right now, probably because I cycled through it at 100 miles an hour to get to you guys about half an hour ago, St Werbergs today is my favourite place in Bristol. Okay, well, thank you for giving us your time this evening. I'm sorry you've come here in a rush, but we really appreciate it. <laughs> so if we talk a bit about the university, um, the University of Bristol obviously has a big impact upon the character of the city um, with the student body and the research that the university does. But often it's quite easy for students to get caught up in the student bubble and uh, get caught up in the sort of studenty hub areas of the city. Would you say, Obviously, Bristol is very diverse. It has a lot of histories and so many different communities. But would you say there is a sort of town and gown divide in Bristol? And what would be your take on that? Yeah, no, that... <coughs> Sorry. Um, I hope that other people doing evening talks <coughs> have always had a beer with them. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, town and gown. I think that um, I think that it's a really interesting point because it's it's now a really big issue in Bristol the the number of buildings in the city that are, uh, that are turning into student accommodation. Um, I think whereas before the students were often um, concentrated in um, you know, the other side of the downs, in the halls, in, in places like Cottam and Redland. Um, I think now um, there's, there's a lot of discussion about how 
how buildings, if they're going to be turned into anything, you know, office buildings in the city centre, that they're turned into student accommodation. Um, and so it's it's it has in the last few years um, really become more of an issue than it's ever been, I think. Um, solely because of the fact that all of the all of the student accommodation now being built in the um, in the city centre. So it's a very visible um, it's a very visible issue. Whereas before you might have only really known um, about the student population if you lived in somewhere like um, you know off Chandos Road or 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 somewhere like that. Um, whereas now the um, now the sheer number of properties are are much more visible to people. So it's a really interesting point because it is only over the last few years that that this has really become really become an issue um i think that it's it's now become it's now become a massive cliche that if a building is going to be turned into something it's going to be turned into student accommodation um and it's and it's and it's and it's and it's happening regularly it really is um and that's no fault of that's no fault of the students whatsoever it's the um it's it's just the the need to house the need to house the students. Um, I think that um, I think that the I think that the town and gown situation. Um, I I've seen it both ways because, like I said, I was at Durham, and um, the town and gown there is is really marked. Um, I think that the student bubble in Durham is a lot smaller. A lot smaller than Bristol, um, if I'm comparing the two, um, but but I think I would I would I would I would be interested for people to 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 go up to the Triangle, say on like a Monday night or a Tuesday night, because most people wouldn't, so they don't actually see that student. Um, the kind of the student population like on mass um i think that bristol is a big enough place for for the um for the student population and the and the local population to not necessarily have to um have to mix um i would i would say that um i would say that there's no there's no there's no clash there's no clash other than when, um, other than when students can be um, slightly, slightly, let's say, um, unneighbourly. So, um, so you know, anyone can be. Uh, can be, it doesn't need. It doesn't have to necessarily be a student to be unneighbourly. But there are certain areas of the city where. Unfortunately, the students have got such a such a reputation, um, and a lot of that is a lot of that is unfair. But you're always going to get a few bad apples, unfortunately. Um, so, so, so I would say that I would say that it's it's amazing to see the number, the statistic of people that Bristol Uni actually employs. It's one of the biggest employers in the city. So, so it's such it's such an important part of the city. Um, I think it'd be fascinating to see to see how how the relationship between city and university changes and develops when the enterprise campus is built because I think that would be a much more visible that'd be a much more visible part of the university next to Temple Meads than up on up on the hill where to most people is kind of a little bit although it's it's paradoxically out of sight although it's you look at it and, and it's and it's there okay so with bristol 24 7 how do you ensure that you're capturing all the voices of the city then not just the mainstream sort of more visible vocal voices and that you're actually giving voice to the sort of less heard of um you know hidden areas of the city yeah uh so so recently we've we've got funding to employ what we're calling um, so the scheme is the community reporters scheme. So um, so we've got reporters um, who are based in places like Hartcliffe, Knoll West, 
um, Lawrence Hill, um, places that don't get typically covered by mainstream media. Um, and, um, and so the community reporters scheme is, is employing community, sorry, employing reporters on the ground in their local communities to tell, to tell stories of their communities, um, which I think is, is, is so important because um, they're the ones that know what's going on. Um, you know, literally reporting on what's happening down, down their street, hyper-local journalism, which, which, is, um, which is something that a lot of organisations have, have tried to do. And I think it's so important um, because people do want to know what's going on down their street. They, they really, really do. Um, and the best people to tell those stories are the people that are part of, part of that community. So, so that's definitely a really great way that we're able to, to, tell, um, to tell these stories of, 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 of parts of Bristol that unfortunately you ask, even someone who might have lived in Bristol their whole lives, um, someone in Clifton might, not, might never have actually been to St Paul's and vice versa. And, and, and that's staggering to think that that's true, but it is true. Um, people who, who might not even be able to point to the Lawrence Western on a map, let alone have actually, have actually been there. Um, so, so I would say the community reporter scheme is, yeah, one way, definitely. And, and just, I just have to remind myself every single day, you know, I'm talking to you from, from just off Millennium Square, so I'm bang in the middle of Bristol, and and I have to remind myself every single day that Bristol is not just BS1, it's not just BS8, it's not Cotton, Redlands, Clifton, BS1, it's maybe verging into Stokes Croft, a bit of a bit of North Street, as as is a big city that we live in, um, so I'm always I'm 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 always out on my on my bicycle. Um, and telling my team to to tell stories, to actually make sure that we're telling stories, and, and that's for, at the forefront of our minds to tell stories from from across the city. Okay, so with so much going on in Bristol all the time, um, you know, it's obviously a great thing for journalists. You're very unlikely to be short of things to write about. But have you found in more um, in more sort of normal times that you've it's been difficult to stay on top of everything happening and there really is just so much going on that it's hard to cover it all. Yeah, um, you put the nail on the head there. Um, I mean, especially with a team of, of just three full-time journalists, including myself, we need to, every single day, we're making decisions about what stories we write about and what stories we don't, um, because we can't do every, as much as we would like to. We can't. We can't cover everything. So we do have to make those journalistic decisions. Um, what is a Bristol twenty four seven story? What do our readers want to know? Um, if the if the BBC have, have have done a story, does that mean that we have to? Does that mean that we have to cover it? Um, you know, I could have easily have um, just got the news of the people up the tree and actually down today just from an email you know they sent pictures they sent a quote but it's not every day that protesters climb up a tree that's about to be chopped down and say we're not moving until I don't know what they're um what they're how long they're staying up there for they're staying up there for until they get pulled down um or they save the tree but it's you know it's things like that that I think it's so important to be able to see with my own eyes, see with our own eyes as as reporters. Um, I would I would always say that the stories I, the stories I really want us to tell, um, are those um, you know in television they're called they're called water cooler moments. They're the moments when once upon a time when we used to go to the office and could have a chat with our colleagues around the water cooler. It's like, oh, did you see this on telly last night? Did, you know, the equivalent of journalism is like, have you heard about this? Have you heard about the guys up the tree in Ashley Down? They're not moving until they save the tree. Um, I want those kind of 
I, I want that kind of reaction to the to the stories. Um, I wrote a piece uh, yesterday um, about a um, about an album from Massive Attack, um, a single actually, Unfinished Sympathy from Blue Lines, which was released in um, 1991. So, so yesterday, 30 years ago, um, was the 30th anniversary of the release of um, Unfinished Sympathy. And it was recorded um, on Richmond Hill Avenue, like just around the back of the Student Union, um, just in a 7A, if you're walking by. Have a little look. Uh, it's, it's, it's called the Coach House, and they're they're ripping it out at the moment because uh, they're turning it into um, into a house. But um, you know, Massive Attack, probably the biggest band ever to come from Bristol, and um, and I, I'd had it in my diary for literally two years that this that yesterday was the 30th anniversary, um, and so I I did a proper deep dive into the um, into the recording process, um, looking at the samples of the song. I went up, talked to the builders outside the studio that are now turning it into, um, into a house. And the reaction to that story yesterday was astounding because people wanted to, to, to tell their friends, it's like, oh my God, can you believe that this song is 30 years old? Um, it, it just hit that sweet spot for people. Um, so, so I'm meandering. I'm very sorry. My stream of consciousness is taking <laughs> taking us through all sorts of avenues this evening. Um, but um, but yeah, the stories that we want to tell are those ones that provoke a, provoke a, provoke a reaction, and you want to you want to you want to <laughs> digitally you want to hit that share button. Mm -hmm. With um, with Massive Attack, obviously one of Bristol's claims to fame, there's so many, and um, even in the last year, Bristol's been sort of catapulted, catapulted onto the stage with um, all the events around in Colston and Greta Thunberg last February. Um, how have you found covering those really sort of big events where Bristol has been, you know, had this light shone on it? Yeah, the last the last 12 months have been, have been, completely what am I trying to say um, it's it's been it's been 12 months for Bristol in terms of news and and it's been an absolute honor you know a career highlights kind of back to back so you know in the midst of in the midst of a global pandemic you know Greta came to visit just before um, just before the pandemic hit, um, that was a that was an amazing moment when she when she marched through the city. Um, I was standing on a standing on a bin opposite Castle Park to get a decent view of the um, of the march, and she um, she retweeted our video, and and that was that was incredible. Um, and then obviously the pandemic, which which is just a once in a lifetime story to cover. Um, uh, when it first hit, we started doing a rolling blog, like a rolling live blog, because there was just, there was just right at the start, there was stuff happening minute by minute. It was, it was just incredible. Um, you know, it's like a drop everything type story and put all our resources onto this. Um, and then in the midst of this global pandemic, you've got Black Lives Matter and 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 the the focus of the world for one particular day was 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 on Bristol um, when the statue was pulled down, um, and again it's just doing everything we can to 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 tell to tell that story to be to be the eyes and ears for our for our readers for Bristol because a lot of people chose with you know that was a time when people didn't weren't leaving their houses. Um, so, so there's a weight of responsibility on on our shoulders as journalists because because we're we're telling we're reporting history as it happens literally in front of our in front of our eyes. Um, so it's been it's been quite some year for Bristol. Um, so quite conscious of the time, so we might move to some questions. But leading on from that. 
Um, in the last year then, how has your reporting sort of been impacted by the pandemic and the way Bristol 24-7 works? How has that been impacted? You mentioned a bit earlier on. Yeah, so obviously we're all, well not obviously, we're all working from home now. Um, so, so, so the challenge when we still had a magazine was putting the magazine together from different parts of Bristol. Uh, that was a real challenge. Just working out how to communicate with colleagues that you would normally just be sitting next to. Um, that's been that that's been a that's been a challenge. Just working out the best way of, of working. Um, I think that we've we've just about we've just about managed. Um, we've we've literally this week we've gone onto Slack. I don't know if you guys know about Slack. So um, we've tried all sorts of things, whether it's Google Hangouts or or just on email. You know, really boring processes that we haven't quite nailed. Because, like I said, in an office, you just call up, Ellie, what are you working on? You know, I'm writing about this. What do you think about that? You can't, you can't do that so easily um, digitally. Um, I, know that some, I know that some workplaces, they kind of have, have, have Microsoft Teams on like the whole day. Um, so, so, so we wouldn't do anything like that. But we just need to remain in constant contact with, um, with people, um, with colleagues. Um, I think that um, you know another challenge of being a journalist in a pandemic is that is that is that being able to actually go out and report. Um, we're, we're officially key workers, so we do have a we can kind of flash the key worker card, metaphorical card, um, if we're out and about because as 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 key workers we're allowed to be out and about. We're not limited by by you know the number of daily exercises that we're allowed to take. Um, so that was um, that's that's you know the government naming journalists as key workers. That's been a, that's been an amazing help because it's, it's impossible to cover everything from in front of the screen. Um, you, you can pick up. I've probably picked up more stories from social media over the last twelve months. Um, than I would normally do, only because of the fact that I'm sat in, a, sat in front of the screen more than I would usually do. Just, just, just looking at the, looking at Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. Um, that's been a really interesting, that's been a really interesting development. You know, looking at, um, looking at people from Bristol who have, who have thrived in the pandemic, specifically online. Um, there's a comedian called um, Abby Clark. If you don't know her, look her up, Abby Clark Comedy on, um, on TikTok and Instagram. And uh, she just started doing these silly dances with her mum and dad. Um, she just graduated from Exeter. So she just moved back home to Bristol with mum and dad. Works in, I think, um, used to work in a cafe in Westbury on Trim, but just starts doing these silly, silly sketches with her mum and dad, put them on Instagram, TikTok, and now, and now she's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of followers on all these social media platforms. Um, so she, fingers crossed, touch wood, she won't have the distinction of being the very last Bristol 24-7 cover star, but I could kind of see her, her star rising um, towards the end of, so, sorry, towards the start of the pandemic. So I think she was on our cover in, anyway, she was on our cover because I'm like this, this comedian is going places. So to 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 watch people thrive in an online sphere, um, there's another guy. He's called um, Joe Jenkins, um, and it, he's only 19, I think. He he deferred. I think he might have even got a place at Exeter, but he um, he turned down the chance to go to uni because his YouTube career was just tanking off. So he just sits in Broadmead and plays the piano. He plays TikTok songs. He plays, um, kind of creates memes around it all. And again, his his numbers and his career. These guys are now are now making a decent a decent living online, and that's just fascinating. Um, being able to tell being able to tell those stories. So if there's a theme emerging of of one element of stories that I tell it's it's um it's it's you know it's 
it's fascinating people i want to tell people stories but a lot of stories these days are in the online world rather than in the um uh in the old-fashioned traditional uh traditional world um on a more so that all sounds really positive but then on a more sort of negative light do you think how will um do you think uh sort of bristol's nightlife which is another thing which is obviously famous for be affected by um pandemic another question we have yeah it's um i, I cycled by the coats here um today and I, I was kind of thinking back thinking back to the summer um so they in a very 2020 word, pivot. They pivoted from being a nightclub to being, um, they had an open air, um, like an open air stage. Um, so they managed to come do something. They had, they had like sit down DJ sets, like eats everything playing a DJ set and people sat down on picnic tables. It's all very, um, uh, very experimental stuff. Um, but they were fortunate enough to have an outside space you know, a lot of a lot of places um, that don't have that outside space. They've just they've, they've, there's there's just nothing been nothing been uh, able to able to take place. Um, they've got the support from 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 government or you know all, all the furlough schemes. But yeah, Bristol's nightlife has just taken. You know, I can I only know I don't I get a nosebleed if I go to Bath, so I can only really talk about Bristol. But yeah, the night scene is nightlife, nighttime economies are taking absolute battering. Um, and there will be casualties, undoubtedly, and it's just incredibly, incredibly sad because through no through no fault of their own. Um, it's been amazing to see how some how some um how some venues have have, have reacted to it. Um, Bristol Improv Theatre. Uh, again, the other side of the student union from Richmond Hill Avenue um, near the Lido. You know, they do regular events online, and they've really, really, um, really, really built up a, 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 an online audience. So again, that's been you know to look at the positives. Um, some of the venues that have adapted to the online world have been have been um, have been really um, it's been really really interesting to to watch. Um, St George's put on concerts, um, you know, online, and then they put on just concerts in there. St George's just off uh, Park Street. Um, they put on concerts in their gar in their garden in the summer, you know, socially distanced. Um, it's it's been it's been really 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 tough to watch though. Um, you know, the old Vic, the old Vic were preparing for. Um, for like a uh, a stripped back show over Christmas um, that they were all set to put on 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 just online, but then the government opened theatres, so I think they managed to put this this show on for about a week and a half before they then just shut down theatres again. And it's like this is it's, it's the situation that we're in is 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 just impossible to 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 plan for to prepare for. Um, it's the same as restaurants. They open and then they were told to shut again. Um, there was one restaurant on Stokes Croft that opened, um, I think it was in December, Nadu, Nadu. Um, and um, they were open for about four days before they were told to shut again. Um, and it, it's, 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 a, it's a horrendous time. But um, I think it's so important that, you know, we can support the independence when when we can um because the big boys will still survive but anything we can do to support bristol's independence because it's you know we've got a thriving independent scene whether that's on the cultural side of things on the shop side of things the music the food and drink um it's um yeah we're certainly not out of the woods yet but um if we can get through this journalistically as well, if we can get through this, we can we can um, we can hold our heads hold our heads high. Okay, um, wonderful. Well, that all sounds very promising. Unfortunately, we are at the end of time. It has gone really quickly. Um, we do have a few more questions, but could I just ask to sort of finish it off? Um, 
quick fire, what would you say is your advice to people who want to pursue journalism? What do you think are some qualities um, that journalists should have sort of on the spot, quick fire? Um, tenacity, curiosity, um, being able to turn your hand to writing, photography, videography, so being a being being very rounded, um, uh, being able to um, being able to turn your hands to to as much to news writing as to feature writing. Um, I think that I think that persistence is key, um, but just just questioning the world around you, just taking not not taking no for an answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well that, that's all really useful tips. To know so thank you for that um we do have a few more questions but we are at the end of time unfortunately so i suppose if, if um people maybe i mean you're very active on twitter they could message you on twitter and maybe you could help them out that way um if you want to plug yeah. your twitter <laughs> um yeah 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 please just get in touch however, however you um however you are sorry that i've sorry that i've rambled um i hope it's been i hope it's been i hope it's been vaguely useful for everybody it's been really interesting yeah really interesting to hear your perspectives on how things have changed this year particularly um but thank you very much for giving us your time this evening it's been great to hear from you